I think our wall clock's got a little slow again. By my clock, it is 5 o'clock, so I'll call this meeting to order. We have a lot of special guests with us this evening. Uh, first, we're going to start off with the invocation, and then I'm going to have uh, Scoutmaster introduce the scouts and have them introduce themselves, and they're going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So we'll do things a little differently this evening. Uh, we'll start off with our invocation, Pastor Phil Roop of Bethel Assembly Church. I see Pastor Bird back there. Yeah. Around. <laughs> Would you lead us in our prayer this evening? <laughs> Hope I can get a prayer through. <laughs> oh, you can. Gracious Father, we thank you for another opportunity that you have uh, blessed us to come together. Uh, in all things, God, we give you thanks. We thank you for the leadership of our city. We continue to pray that you would give them wisdom in how to govern and how to lead us. We thank you for this great city that you have blessed us to live in. Uh, there are so many other places that are suffering and doing a lot of bad things, but God, you have blessed our city, and we thank you for it. And we ask you now to give us grace and to grace this meeting. Uh, let everything be done tonight be done in decency and in order. And we always, always and praise for all the blessings that you have bestowed on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. I'll teach you to be here first. Won't I? Yeah. Yeah. And before we get into the pledge, I'd like Scoutmaster Sam Herndon to come forward. He's going to remove the microphone so each one of these future leaders in our city will introduce themselves. I can figure out how to get it loose. Okay. First thing I want to do is bring up a young man that is actually the leader of the troop. I'm the scoutmaster. I'm his advisor. He, this, the troop runs itself, and this young man is actually the troop leader. Come on up, Jalen. Jalen Hamilton is the senior patrol leader, and he actually runs the troop. All right, I'm going to let everybody else come up. Just come up real quick. Come introduce yourself. What's your name? Hello, my name is Akita Diaz. Hello, I'm Riley Cockerham. Hello, my name is Hello, my name is Connor Poole. Hello, my name is Mason Thurr. Hello, my name is Jacob Milo. Hello, my name is Delina Diaz. I'm George Dean. Hello, my name is Jonah Brink. Hi, my name is Vince Gruber. My name is Brody Kwame. My name is JT Gruber. My name is Parker Estes. You can say it in there. My name is Parker Estes. My name is Forrest LaBell. My name is Jace Moore. I'm also introduced to adult leaders. These, these adults are the ones that make this unit grow. And he's new. This is Ryan Cockerham. He just joined us. Um, Ryan uh, Dean is in the back. Uh, D.A. King, uh, Kevin Kane, and Char Charlie Herbst is hiding way in the back. Mr. Charlie was my predecessor as Scoutmaster. Now, gentlemen, you'll lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and for which it stands, nation, under God, Thank you all very much. We are basically in our study session. We'll have the official session shortly after we go through some of the stuff in the agenda. Uh, uh, first item of business is that uh, we're going to have a presentation from uh, the Chamber of Commerce Convention and Visitor, Visitor Bureau and Magnet. Well, I'm going to go first. You're going to go first. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Um, the purpose of Cape Girardeau's Visitor Center, or Visit Cape as we have been branded, is to promote the city of Cape Girardeau for the purpose of economic development through increased tourism and business um, through increased business and tourism, rec and <laughs> increased tourism, increased business and recreational tourism. I'll get that right eventually. 
our annual report is what I have provided you with. And if you look at it, there are over 200 activities that we have been involved in. Um, when you go down the first column, it'll show the event. Then it will show the sponsors. Then if you look at Visit Cape where it says sponsored, those are events that we have actually put dollars towards. And then the next one is promoted. Those are things where we have given baskets, we have put them on our website, we have helped with their um, presentation as far as getting them together, getting the resources that they need, these of that nature. And then you'll see the event date, the number of attendees, and then some of those will have an ec estimated economic impact because if I can't get numbers that are pretty accurate, idea, things definitely had an economic impact, but I, re I would rather underestimate than overestimate. The next thing I'd like to share with you that you have a copy of is our hotel motel tax receipts. And as you can see, October and November have been record-breaking months for us, and even January. What kind of things makes this happen? If I look at January, I can tell you that we had three very successful volleyball tournaments, and we had one very successful Reebok basketball tournament, along with the new indoor barbecue, which was When Pigs Fly. And so those kind of things are what we like to see happening in Cape Girardeau because it's things like that in a dead season for us. January, February is really slow. And that has impacted it where we were record breaking in this January. The other things that I can tell you about is our advertising. And I shared three magazines just to let you know the quality of the magazines that we promote in. Uh, those uh, we advertise in about 50 publications and we target the markets of Illinois, Arkansas, Missouri, Tennessee, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Texas, and Oklahoma pretty much our bordering states where they can come and do a day trip, staycation, or anything. So those are our target markets. Um, we've been known that research shows that if you give people printed material, it will cause them to have a digital reaction. And that's very much shown by us because our click-through rate for our website is at 8.76%, which is well above the 2% industry standard for most tourism operations. And finally, our activity. Uh, Elisa attends at least uh, 10 to 15 trade shows a year. Those sales missions are like teams, Travel South Domestic, Sports Missouri Group Travel, and the Working Women's Survival Show. At those events, she will have 30 to 40 appointments. They are like seven min minute appointments. So really all it is to get a hook, to get them to think about coming to Cape Girardeau, spending their time either on a travel, with a convention, a meeting, group travel, something, but get them here. So uh, what you have on your desk, there's not something to beat each other up with, which I've seen um, people kind of waving, but it's actually a spatula that was handed out at our most recent um, leisure show. We only go to one leisure show a year, and it's the Working Women's Survival Show in St. That event will have thousands of women passing by, and there's a few men that are drug along, but it will have those people there to get. And those spatulas were the, uh, from my office, that's her poppy's uh, recipe, and it was attached. So we think that'll be a big hit for people to, they'll think about us every now and then when they're, oh, visit Cape, maybe I need to go to Cape Girardeau when they take those home with them. And our final thing that I left with you is just an idea that gives you the estimated economic impact. It'll show you how we've increased in our hotel motel receipts uh, since 2014. We're at 13.7%. And if we keep doing as well as we've been doing, we're going to be even more than that in, with 2020. Uh, we've reached the restaurant tax receipts have increased by 19.4%. And combined totals were at 17.5%. So I feel really good about how Visit Cape is performing for Cape Girardeau. On the back, we have our estimated in, uh, econ 
estimated economic impact calculator. And what you'll notice on this one, I just want to point out, is that at the bottom it shows that we had 220 participants times two days and then $220. That $220 changes with the type of event that you had. If it were a sporting event, it'd be $95. If it was a group travel overnight, it'd be $110. But this is for a convention. So just giving you an idea of the difference that that number may be. And that's all I have for you. Amazing to me that you've got that much of an increase in restaurant tax and hotel and motel tax. And, and uh, that amount of increase in just a few years is is a lot. Thank Pretty you. excited about it. Just Thank you. getting those groups to come in. All right. Thank you very much, Brenda. Thank you. My beautiful assistant city manager, Scott Meyer, distributes the rest of the material. Good evening, everybody. John Maynard with the uh, Cape Girardeau Area Chamber of Commerce and Commerce. All right, cool. Please refrain from cheating and looking ahead, and we'll talk about each of these individually as we go through them just a little bit. First, call your attention to the one that's labeled Magnet at the top. It's just a single page front and back. I want to touch on a couple of different things to go over, and then we'll move on from there. And certainly at the end, I'll ask or uh, take any questions. If you have anything in the, as we're going over it, I'm fine with that too. So just raise your hand or look at me or something, and we can we can deal with questions. So taking a look at 2019. <laughs> This handout. So a couple things I want to mention under the project activity really quickly. Right now we have 13 active projects. I'll mention again that the way we deal with active projects now, we don't just active project list. It has to be something that we're actually working with at some stage. And there's been some kind of a communication and it really is a project. Um, so you can look down there and look at some of the numbers. That represents 400 plus jobs and five plus million investment capex in, in the community. On the economic development successes from 2019, I do want to call out a couple. Some I'm sure you've heard about, some we've had direct impact with, and some just worked with um, on the sidelines or in a backup role. Uh, certainly the psychiatric hospital, which you've now seen, the, and then the Veterans Administration Clinic, which is due to start this spring sometime. Um, those will add in excess of 350 to 400 jobs in the community for those two facilities. Go down about halfway and we have the paperwork on a local company with an IT expansion that will be in that 75 to 76. I know those are pretty accurate numbers, but they got to do exacts on these applications. And I fully expected to be able to announce that tonight, but we still don't have a press release from the company, so we're holding. Um, but these are extremely well-paid jobs. This is a national company who has chosen to do significant expansion in the Cape Girardeau area. And I'm gonna say not just over the next two to three years, but I think moving forward a lot of years. So gonna be a really big deal. Go down towards the end, we uh, here and I go to Jackson's Board of Aldermen to talk to them about a project that we've been working on in Jackson, uh, which is more professional jobs that will be in that 35 to 50 range. And we'll uh, probably also include a new building over there. That is another national company that has recognized this area for the stuff that we're doing and the things that we're accomplishing in the IT and the professional realm. So that's another big one. 
have a couple of projects or a couple of prospects that we're working with on the spec building as well that you see listed there. Uh, data benchmarks, you can look down at the bottom and just look at, you, you kind of understand where our unemployment rates are. Uh, at the end of December 2019, we were at 2.9% in um, Cape County and 3.3% in Scott County. Um, the employment trends are up. We get a monthly report on the eight. Cape Jackson MSA is consistently in the top three for jobs added, which is all good at this point. Um, but it does, again, put a significant stress on labor force, which we've talked about a bunch. Uh, sales tax, the latest figure that they have released, which obviously they are way behind, but 2018 numbers are almost $1.5 billion in sales tax. Um, again, while your numbers are not increasing, the sales tax rates here are, I mean, the sales taxes and sales here are extremely strong. And obviously a lot of that occurs in a way that you guys don't net any revenue. Flip on the backside, you see a little about our business retention efforts that we do through the magnet as well. We visit companies on a regular basis, gain information from them and use it to plan moving forward. The bottom bullet point there is the key findings continue to be workforce related in one way, shape, or form, and I'll refer to that again as we move forward a little bit. Infrastructure advocacy, you see several things that we work on. I will say, please visit transamericacorridor.com. It is the new website for the Transamerica Corridor. It is a different concept on the old I-66 project, if you will. <clears throat> and I just got an email that showed that the Transamerica Corridor and an article made the cover of B Magazine in which they talk about what that new concept is. But basically, looking at the corridor as a corridor of the future, not just a highway. It's looking as it is a smart vehicle corridor, potentially resource corridor for utilities, for water, for a lot of different things, uh, potentially even high-speed freight rail. And it's a step that the country needs to take. And again, the ideas and the, and the impetus is originating right here with a group that's uh, associated with the magnet. Workforce development highlights, they have several things listed there for you that we continue to do. Um, we also appreciate the efforts that, that the university does in this area with Dan sitting on your council as well. And they've got a big day coming up Thursday, um, again, with, with uh, job placement stuff that will happen. But we continue to do several programs through the chamber and the magnet, and we will talk more about uh, talent retention and recruitment as we have a solidified plan that will roll out for you in the second half of this year. Then I've listed some other significant happenings. We continue to have leaders lunch. We had one today. And one thing I wanted you to note is that last bullet point there to, to make sure that you understand the relevance of your local group. And that is we have staff on Chamber and Magnet that sit on the board of directors of at least seven statewide chamber and economic development organizations. So folks here are very plugged into what's going on at the state, um, represent you extremely well, um, includes Brenda, who is just done. We have lots of folks that serve on statewide organizations on the boards, not just as members. So that's important. I'm going to move on to the second page, and that's this. Now, when I talk, I talk about lots of different areas. I may talk about Cape County. I may talk about City of Cape. I may talk about Cape Jackson MSA. I may talk about the Southeast Missouri. So right now I'm going to refer to the Southeast Missouri region. And if you look at this handout, it's a four pager down in the corner, it shows you what the Southeast Missouri region <clears throat> is. It's those counties listed. So there'll be some things that are different than what you're used to hearing about Cape County or city of Cape. But there's a couple things I want to point out just for first one is on the first page under workforce demographics, halfway down, there's a category called ages 55 and older. I want you to understand that 23% of the workforce in this region is 55 and older. And we are already in a tight labor market. Some of us might resemble that age demographic, but it is, uh, we are right there with the state of Missouri and right there nationwide. So basically right at one of every four workers is 55 or older right now. So that says a lot about where we need to go and where we need to head from workforce development. If you flip over on the second page, I want to point out a couple of things under the industry analysis section. <clears throat> Top employing industries. 
For the South re Southeast region include healthcare and social assistance as number one, and not just as number one, but as a far leading number one. Second one for this area is manufacturing, and then you can see the others listed there, retail trade, et cetera, et cetera. But healthcare and social assistance is huge in this area. Just for your reference, Cape Girardeau County, 27% of our workforce is in the healthcare and social assistance area. So more than one in four workers. If you go to the next page on page three, again, just want to show you that the largest growth industry industries from 2016 to projected 2026 include healthcare and social assistance again. And then I want to call your attention to the bottom of that page and the next page, which are occupational projections. Again, for that period of time, they have three categories called now, next, and later. Now is a high school diploma or equivalency. Next is some type of certificated or, or similar type program. Later is college degree. And then if you flip over to the back, it will show you the number of job projections for each of those categories. And you will notice three things. The largest number of jobs are in the lower two categories. And then the next is the college degree. Now, I'm not here to say that a college degree is not important. That's not what I'm saying. But what I want you to understand is as a magnet organization, we believe that talent comes in all three of those forms. And all of our local companies have to have talent in all three of those forms. We have to have the high school graduates that are willing and able to work and fill a lot of those spots, as well as the certificated programs and as well as the college degree. So take those with you. Final thing I have here before I answer any questions for you, and media just showed up so I can answer almost any questions for you, <laughs> is uh, Kim Volker in our office, our VP, this other list. This is a almost complete, and I won't say complete, but an almost complete list of workforce development efforts in the area, programs, organizations, different things, because again, it remains our number one priority. And I wanted you, many times I will hear people say, we're not doing anything, or there's nothing going on in the area, or we're not aware of anything. So I wanted you to have this, take it with you. If you have any questions about any of these things, let me know. And if you have additions to these, if you're aware of things that we're not aware of, um, or that we don't have on this list, let, let us know because we'd like to continue to build this list and make sure that we have uh, additional resources so that we know to send people to get additional help. So um, I appreciate working with your mayor, your city manager, um, obviously on the magnet board that, that get to meet with us once. Um, our, our economy locally is doing well compared to a lot of others. Doesn't mean we don't have challenges, but uh, we work very hard to do what we can and, and continue to have success and love and, and appreciate working with you and, and looking forward to continue to do so. Having said that, I would be more than happy to an answer any questions about this, any rumors you may have, anything else that, that I need to address. Again, I'll do whatever I can. Hi. Yes, sir. So on, on this sheet here, yes. the first uh, comment that you made on the workforce demographics that 23% age 55 and older, is that is there a trend there? Has that been steady for a number of years? Do we see that? I, I don't know. That's just, a great question, curious. and, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer. I will say that, that um, deducting from what we know with the number of mm -hmm. and everything else, I would say it's... I mean, maybe it's slowing down a little bit because there's a lot of boomers retiring. Yeah. Um, but we know from our high schools and our universities that we're graduating less and less students. Yeah. And and we know that the situation we're in with the, with this workforce is it's uh, I mean it's a challenge. Tightest workforce since the Vietnam War. So tightest workforce in 50 years. Mm. Uh, most have. In fact, I did this on a KRCU thing. Most places have more open positions than they do people looking for positions. Mm -hmm. And many cities, counties, states are offering signing bonuses. I mean, there yeah. are states offering bonuses. If you move there, they'll pay you 10 grand and abate some of your property taxes if you buy a house. And I'm not suggesting that locally. Don't that. <laughs> but there, there are a lot of that. There's a lot of that going on in, in a lot of regions. Is that for, I mean, are you seeing that for 
all types of work or specialized? Yeah, it is. Uh, some states are, if you move and buy a house and you're employed, you qualify. Wow. Uh, so it's, it's just trying to attract workers to the area. Now, granted, some of those, boy, how can I say this nicely? Some of those are in areas that may otherwise have more of a challenge to attract workers, um, but it's still out there and it's still a battle for people. Well, it says, to, it says to us, we cannot afford to have any of our citizens that we aren't doing all we can to make them, uh, to, to help them uh, be employed and be skilled in their employee. Absolutely. And so I think that's the reason we work so hard together and um, the porch and looking sure that we are um, that we are embracing and, and empowering, um, you know, our existing workforce that is there. It's not very, there's not, not a lot of people that aren't working, but uh, take those that are working and give them better skills to do more right. and uh, continue to, to work. So I appreciate all the, we work together on that and continue to work. Let me add on that real it's quick, Scott. It's absolutely key to, as we try to re recruit people, first thing to ask, where are we going to get our employees? Real quick, because I saw Renita come in and CB did your prayer for you. And, and um, we, one of the frustrating things, one of the, one of the real challenges we have is, um, I'll draw a correlation. So when I was looking for my first jobs or first and second jobs, you know, there was one place you went to find jobs and that was the newspaper in the job posting section. And you can go watch old movies from the 70s and 80s, and it's mm -hmm. the same thing. You sat down with the help wanted. A location that told you what the available jobs were and, and that can, you have one place you could go. We are so far removed from that now that it is a challenge to match the available jobs with the available workforce and the available skill set, which is why you have this sheet which is why you have all of these organizations and, and we're working with them. And Kim is doing a yeoman's work in, in trying to pull them together and figure out the best ways and the best approaches to matching those things up and figuring out exactly where we have the gaps and what we can do. Cause it's a challenge. And you know, you work in that industry and, um, and employers are open than they used to be open to but it's still a challenge to match up what we have locally with what those available positions are. I think the workforce issue is, uh, it's, it's vital that, that I think we have a governor who's addressing that statewide. Absolutely. And I think our local magnet is in, in addressing some of those things are not just looking at manufacturers and, and no. that kind of thing. You're looking at going to all the regional local high schools and, and trying to get young people to commit to, right. you know, to a career, to some career somewhere. And education's changing. You know, it used to be, uh, you know, education's kind of changed in, in different decades. Uh, you know, our cradle to college is now cradle to career. Right. And uh, that's something that our local district has picked up on. Others have too, and it makes a big difference uh, knowing that we need we're going to need in our country a lot more people that that have jobs that don't go to college that's right and can do much better in careers without a college education so that's important to get that out there that's true and we thank thank you for all you do for magnet and all you do for our whole area Brenda and I appreciate the opportunity. We are available anytime. If you have input, questions, anything else, let us know. I know I meet with several of you off and on on a regular basis, and I appreciate that opportunity. But anything else we can do, would love to do so. Just thanks again to Brenda. You know, in the last few years, the the uh, our our Parks event folks and our PIO Amen. folks have come together with with uh, that uh, that committee and the folks in the hoteliers and. And I mean, that has just uh, really come together to be a real huge strength of ours, which was, it wasn't that we weren't willing to work together before, but it just didn't seem to gel, but it really has in the last
I agree. And Brenda's done a great job with that. It's a monthly meeting and it, it really has been beneficial. Fantastic. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Now we'll get into reports. Uh, the first is just city council. Anybody have anything they want to bring up? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so I um, attended quite a few events since the last meeting. On February 19th, um, we hosted the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, so the principal advisor to the president on um, uh, drug policy, James Carroll, and his senior policy advisor for rural affairs, Ann Hazlitt, to discuss uh, what's happening in uh, the local community as it relates to combating the opioid crisis and other um, uh, behavioral health issues. Um, that afternoon, um, uh, Director Carroll and uh, Ms. Hazlett, uh, and Dan was there as well, and I participated in a roundtable with Governor Parson um, and Congressman Smith and other policymakers. This was to discuss the Office of National Drug Control Policy's new um, Rural Community Action Guide, uh, Building Stronger, Healthier, Drug-Free Communities. Uh, and this is a guide that uh, I can't remember exactly how many federal departments, like 17 federal departments weighed in on and wrote different uh, sections of this manual to uh, build uh, healthier communities. Um, it, it's available on the Office of National Drug Control Policy's website. Uh, so that was nice. I don't know, Dan, did you have anything to add on that? No, you know, it was a, it was a, a good roundtable discussion. Um, it just kind of interesting just to hear the federal take on, especially whenever it comes to the workforce. Uh, the part of it that I found very inspiring was uh, the conversation around trying to, to change people's thoughts towards non-traditional hiring, mm -hmm. um, trying to get people to look towards opportunities for expungement and hiring for people with felonies, trying to look towards uh, helping people with disabilities and their hiring practices. And so from that conversation, I, I found it to be very good to start hearing about these areas of, of hiring that have been really, really tough, um, especially over the past couple of years. So, so I'm hoping for some, some large scale change in those regards. And, and I'll add to that, um, uh, th that um, the morning of the, the 19th, when Director Carroll visited uh, my, my organization, uh, he, you know, we, we get caught up a lot in um, thinking about what is happening today or, or responding to crisis, which is needed, and, and the opioid uh, crisis is just that. But um, one of the things that um, he mentioned was in the rural communities and um, in, in our communities, uh, methamphetamines are, are on the rise again. And that is something the federal government is also putting some resources behind. Um, so that was the 19th and the 20th. I participated in a panel discussion uh, put on by Epic Early Impact Early Prevention Impacts Communities, uh, and this was on the uh, medical marijuana um, ballot initiative and how it's going to affect the local communities. That panel with uh, Lieutenant Smith from KPD. Uh, uh, prosecuting attorney Mark Welker and John Payne from New, Appro New Approach, Missouri. He was one of the authors of the ballot initiative. Good discussion, a lot of great questions that day. Um, a lot of people just kind of wanting to know uh, more information because I think there were a lot of um, a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of um, uh, really not a lot of information out there. So it was I think it was helpful for those. There was about I think there were about seventy five or eighty in the room that day. Attended Old Town Cape dinner on February 27th. That was great. And um, attended the school board meeting. They talked about the um, pool concept. I don't know. But I'll let others um, we'll give their reports. We'll have a discussion on that shortly. Okay. That's all I have. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> Good. Uh, 
to have John here give the magnet report. We've got a meeting in the morning. Uh, I want to point out that our Citizens Academy uh, kicks off this 20 participants in that, and that's about what we want per session. So I think that uh, it's uh, something that has uh, been very, very good for our citizens and educating them on how our city works. Uh, Chamber First Friday Coffee is this week, uh, TTF 6 is on the program, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, next week on Tuesday the 10th, there's an MML regional meeting in Scott City. I don't know how many of you have responded to go to that. Uh, it'd be nice if we had a contingent show up there for that. Uh, we're beginning TTF6 presentations with service clubs and other organizations around. And uh, I kind of asked Scott, staff can't get together a list of when those are and where they are so we know what staff's presenting and what council person and, or uh, committee member may be there. If, if we can't get a council person or me there, then one of the committee members uh, volunteered to help too. So uh, we need to have somebody besides staff there. Same thing with uh, legislative uh, trips to Jeff City. We've identified uh, several dates coming up about every two weeks uh to try to get up there i think scott's going up tomorrow uh so we'd like to have uh, uh somebody else go up maybe the 18th or 19th of march april 8th and 9th april 22nd and 23rd and we're reserving may to kind of see what happens with some of the legislation and the session's over the 15th uh we're trying to do these on wednesday and thursday because their fridays are out and they're not there but uh, May 6th or 7th or May 13th and 14th. We'd rather go 6th or possible because it's not next to the last day when things get so hectic that uh, it's hard to find anybody to meet with. Uh, so if you'll look at those dates and uh, let Scott know if you're available to, to maybe go up there and make a trip to Jeff City, maybe spend the night and, and uh, uh, participate Thursday Wednesday and Thursday or whatever we get scheduled. Uh, uh, I know you know the uh, the uh, annual retreat is Friday, April seventeenth. So we'll put that put that on your calendars. Friday, April seventeenth. Friday, April seventeenth. Gathering the distance about it well I, I know they've been trying um, they've been trying to get dates when everybody the most people could be here staff wise and and myself and, uh, youth and government day is march uh i won't be here that day robbie's agreed to be our uh, mayor pro tem that day and uh it's it's kind of a, they've got this schedule 8 to 2.30. You don't have to be there for everything, but. Uh, I spoke to you right there, okay. okay, please let Gail know if you can participate in any form so we'll, they'll know who to match students with. Uh, it's really a neat experience for the students. It's a learning opportunity for them by government about how our city works, how our county works. And uh, it's a great program. And the, the list of high schools has really expanded this year uh, to a few more. So there'll be a lot more students involved. So look at the information that Gail sent out and uh, try to help some that day. Uh, can't think of too much else. Uh, this Wednesday is the uh, Noon Optimus Annual Chili Day and I'll be there again, like I have been the last 35 years cooking chili. So <laughs> this will be my 36th year. I keep telling them I'm getting too old for this. I can't do this all day. Uh, Charlie Herbst back there has been working on it too. Uh, 
it's a big deal and we'll serve upwards close to 2,000 people chili on Wednesday. So remember to put that in your, in your brain to come out and have some chili for lunch or dinner or to get a go. Uh, can't think of anything else, Scott. Um, don't have anything uh, other than what you've already mentioned. Other than I think uh, have a conversation about the aquatic center that you mentioned earlier. Right. So, what we would like what, <clears throat> what we'd like is to have council. I know some of you were um, were at the meeting. Kind of give your impressions of that, and then uh, we plan to have the same presentation uh, next meeting. So, if there are other things you'd like them to address or questions you have. Uh, you'd like them to delve deeper into. If you can uh, identify that for us, that would help. Uh, so I think we're looking for um, guidance as far as what can we present at the next meeting to help uh, you uh, consider this. Obviously, you know, uh, my major concern has always been the operating um, of this and um, They've worked on that. That was what the report revolved around was how do we operate it and how much is it going to cost? Obviously, we've been talking about our operating budget is is um, in peril and that we are very concerned about that. And so adding to that is is really difficult. And um, so we'd like to hear what you, uh, what you saw and some of the concerns you might have. Yeah, first of all, I, I was not there and I did not hear, I've got a, I got a copy of the presentation, but when you're not there, you can't hear any remarks. And I'll, I'll go first because there are a couple of things on my mind that, that I don't know if I talked about. And if they were, you can bring that up and let me know. I know that the revenue projections were based on numbers uh, put together by our staff and by their staff and increases in fees for for our citizens to use it, uh, increases in fees for teams that, that are there at swim meets and whatnot. And uh, I personally, I'd just like to see what those fees so that we can tell citizens, you know, how much is it gonna, how much is it gonna come more? Oops, excuse me. I'm not used to that mic sticking up in my face. Uh, and there are, you know, we talked in the past about uh, other revenue sources like uh, uh, finding sponsors that may uh, have a pass program where they would the schools could give passes to to groups of kids uh, uh, naming rights or other things that we've talked about uh, and the other thing that the big thing that that sticks in my mind is that you know, I know the schools are are doing more programming than they've ever done before with a with the new pool of elementary school. And it's not just Jefferson, they want to involve all the elementary schools. And if that's the case, and uh, if they start that elementary level, is that going to continue to the middle school and the junior high level using a renovated pool at Central? Uh, if that's the case, and they're doing a lot more programming, then uh, I, you know, it, it's my mind that we ought to maybe strive. I know in the past our cost share has been 60% city, 40% schools, but I would like to strive more toward 50-50. I don't know if that was discussed, uh, uh, but I just think with, with all of the changes that are gonna occur, uh, I think it might be something that I'd like to see on the table to discuss and at least have the uh, our staff and maybe the school staff go back and look at that and when they give the presentation to us at our next meeting if anybody else has any other concerns or questions bring those up tonight they can look at those and maybe address those when they come in two weeks I wasn't there so I was just going to say, I kind of feel like this whole conversation is putting the cart before the horse because we actually haven't had the presentation on it. And so lobbing questions out about X, Y, and Z, they haven't, we haven't officially gotten this presentation. We haven't seen and heard the actual presentation. Members of the council that actually was there. means it was official. <laughs> what? Uh, I mean, oh, because... And, 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 
hear. Let me respond to that a little bit, Dan, because I, I did have a bunch of very specific, detailed numbers, questions, and I don't think this is the right for those because there are members of council who haven't heard it. But I do have some specific points that I think city staff might want to think about bringing to that presentation before the next meeting. Uh, and, and, and one of those in particular uh, is how we arrived at the increased expenses on Central Pool. Um, just to, to throw that out there, um, from the city's 60% um, uh, subsidy, we'd be looking at an increase uh, just the first year of $85,842 at Central Pool. Um, and my question would be to bring back to the council, um, no more increased footprint, the opportunity for no more programming, um, why such the great increase in expense? Well, you're going to have um, a larger building and you're going to have... You can increase the footprint. The footprint is the footprint, right? No, but the building itself is bigger. So I think it's going to be bigger than the bubble. Plus, you're you're going to have better air quality, which means probably yeah, you're bringing a lot of fresh you're air. Bring a lot of fresh air. If I remember right, that's one of the big costs. But we'll, we'll certainly spell out all yeah, that. Yeah, I, I just think that's a valid. That's a valid. Yeah, I mean, we're not we're not you know we're not expanding the foot. We're not doubling the footprint. So there's you know. It's just something you start looking at a 40 year plan, which is what we've gotten out of the current pool. And you're talking about a pretty big chunk of change in increased expenditures by the city in the times where we're trying to figure out how to cut expenses. So I just think that's something that maybe needs to be talked about a little bit more how we arrived at, at those numbers. Go ahead and just back on just a little bit just so the audience knows. It's also uh, assumed a we're, we're going to condition the air for three more months, which currently it's totally open. We're going to we have the doors will come open, but you still have to have to condition the air. But we will. It's a very valid question, and mm -hmm. we'll go into more detail with Dark Dan. Anybody else? Um, I'm looking at or looking. I had just gotten this report last Thursday, and it looked good. I would just be wondering when we're talking about budget. Is this um, with Parks and Rec? Would there be an idea where they would fund our sixty? Um, would the proposal be hopefully to propose it with making some efficiencies within their budget? I'd like to know where that money's going. I believe I guess it's whatever it is proposed. One hundred. It's an increase in sixty-two thousand. Per year, and then obviously seventy thousand. That's that's the first year. I mean, that doesn't that doesn't account for inflation or anything else. So, but essentially, it's a difference of somewhat on on central pool, and then an additional seventy thousand dollars for for the Jefferson piece, which is a total of twenty hundred and thirty thousand dollars, just shy of one thirty five total. Right. Yeah. So then, that would, my question is: is that is that is that being discussed about? us being able to fund that out of the current parks and rec budget. Because I mean obviously right now we're we're scrounging for every penny yep. uh, whenever the budget team is meeting. So you know it just seems logical to try to find that, you know, where does that come from? Where is that where is that? Right. Um, I mean the numbers, you know Going back to, to uh, PRS one as far as revenue and everything, I trust staff. You know, as far as their revenue projections, have been pretty close on a lot of different projects that we've done over the years. So, you know, I tend to those look pretty good to me, and I tend to trust in that respect. Uh, but the budget, where our portion is going to come, is, is my. One thing I'm, I meant to say, and Julia, it was clear from the meeting that the school district staff and the city staff put a lot of work uh, into the process. So thank you for, for that work. I didn't want that to get lost in my other comments. I know there's a lot, of, a lot of, a lot of staff time has gone into this, both on, on the district part and on our part, and we appreciate that. Uh, I. You know the one the one big surprise to me when I look at 
uh, when we when we first talked about an aquatic center, the scary thing about building a big aquatic center was the consultant came back with this cost of, I mean, you're talking about building a 50 meter pool with a leisure concept and the whole works, that your cost is going to, your operation cost is going to go to a million to a million and a half per year, which is a lot more than the 280 to $300,000 we have now. And it was just, it just it wasn't possible it was not possible we couldn't raise the money to build it in the first place and we sure couldn't afford to run it i think that that what we have come up with for our community for 10 million dollars is probably the most workable solution that i could ever imagine uh, and you look at the total cost of running both of those facilities operationally is $500,000 or less, which is considerably less than a million. Look at the opportunity for additional revenue that will, will help bring that down a little bit. Uh, you know, we were all worried about you know, where are we gonna come up with another half a million dollars a year or more for a pool. Now it's, it's much, much, much less than that. And still it's increased and no one ever thought that a pool was, was going to be something that's going to pay for itself because it's not. It's a commitment on our part for our citizens to is this something that we want to subsidize so that we can have both a competitive pool and a leisure pool in our community. And uh, I think the, the concept we've come up with, uh, once we look at the center, we can renovate that and do what we want to do then uh, I think it's the best case. Everybody's, you know, questions and concerns um, and, and also praises of what's gone into getting us to this point already. Um, you know, certainly, um, probably, uh, Julie, is it fair to say some of these numbers are best, very educated, guesses as to what, you know, based on a, a, a great <clears throat> professional staff that has been in this game for a long time, but um, uh, the, the, Robbie touched on it earlier, the, the overall economic picture is what we really need to take into consideration with all of this. So Scott, to your question, um, it, you know, we, uh, we can't just talk about the pool numbers. We uh, so we'll need a lot numbers. of, and maybe that's bumping up the, the budget discussion a bit, but um, certainly in the context of trying to trying to find money to get to zero yeah. on reoccurring on reoccurring costs. Right. So our reoccurring costs currently exceed our reoccurring revenue, and we've identified that cost and we've talked about that. And in that, now you have another piece competing for that, and. Um, so it's very uh, astute, I think, in saying it needs to be looked at holistically. We can't just isolate and say, okay, well, how do we do this? And how can we come up with it? And, um, and so I think it's, it's very relevant that uh, we put it in that context of parks and rec budget and how does that work and how could there maybe, you know, like the indoor sports complex where we had a, we had a few years to kind of get there and how does that work? They did a plan there. But then, not just that parks and rec budget, and how that might on a bigger picture, how does it fit into the total into the total picture? And uh, I think those are great questions and ones that are glad. I'm glad you're asking. Let's put it that way. Well, I've been concerned about the whole time is how we operate this thing. <coughs> I, were you gonna say something? Go ahead. Oh, I was there as well, and I wanted to to say once again. Um, that it was a great job by the staffs to come together and be able to pull the money, the figures as much as they can, um, and the, all the work that's been went into it and we went through. And then I guess some of the things that the questions I had um, going into it, I, I have said it all along is in to build off of your comment, Mayor was, it, you know, it's the most workable option 
and I agree. That's what the companies come up with, you know, the most workable option. And the question we have to decide is whether it's the right option to do. And that's what we kind of hinted on. And um, I guess some of the, the major things that I took away was, um, uh, well, one big piece that hinging a lot of my decision on is this geotech analysis of the land underneath both properties because that's what the consultant said could add a significant amount of cost to the actual capital investment of the construction. And how are we gonna finance that when the final consultant recommendation was for an $11.9 million option that now we're trying to squeeze into a $10 million option. One of the ways that they said it recommended to go from that was to take the leisure pool and go from a 4,000 square foot pool to a 3,000 square foot pool. So are these numbers based on a 3,000 square foot pool? And if that's the option we're gonna to get down, we won't know that till the bid process. How does that affect our revenue project projections? Um, the other piece is, and anytime you do any of these predictive analysis or um, pro formas, you have a series of assumptions. And I guess that's what I would like a little more detail. I know it's hard meetings uh, and the giving the 10,000 foot view to really get into that um, from the school board, school board meeting, but I just look at you know, we're not increasing the footprint of the Cape Municipal Pool, the current pool, um, putting a permanent structure over it, and um, going to have the same operating hours, they said, yet it's almost doubling the revenue projections from what we had our last recorded year to what the first recorded year is going to be. Where is that coming from? Is that just increased fees um, on the, the swim teams? Or does it also take into account that now we're gonna have another leisure pool option, so even those leisure swimmers, we're gonna cannibalize ourselves, and some of those are gonna to go to the new Je Jefferson pool. So there's gonna be some cannibalization. Um, overall, if you take both pools into account, revenue projections go from our 107 to quadruple that between both pools, our revenue projections. And so maybe a little more into what those assumptions are, if they're just gate fees, if they're parties, if it's just purely we're gonna capture a winter market that now we do not have, that we can't adequately suffice with the bubble. Um, yeah, so much to Ryan's comment, the expenses, what are the assumptions there? Because it's a, well, well on the actual um, consultant's recommendation actually. And even with that, I have some questions because they said they've only done one such structure to really base their ongoing expenses on. There's a lot of question marks there that could really dive into our pocketbooks. And as a steward of the taxpayer, taxpayer dollars, that's, that's some of the most glaring questions that I have and that I'd like a little more information, um, if it's at all possible, um, when we hear it until we are next council meeting, so. Well, I think that's where we want to have this discussion so that maybe some of that information could be provided in two weeks. If not, uh, it may take a little longer but we got to have answers. And if you think of additional questions, certainly send them to me and we can make sure that we to answer those. And then if, like I said, if more questions come up, we'll work on them and get, get you the answers or come to the next meeting. Great discussion, I think. Excellent. All right. Anybody else? If not, are there any appearances here this evening for any item not on the agenda? Bud, would you give me a picture there? There. Uh, there. Your fuel place. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Those are pictures of the Cape for Water problem. My name is Steve Hinman. I live in 1901 Brewster Street. I've been a, a I was born and raised here. I worked for the city of Cape. My mom worked for the city of Cape. My neighbor retired from the city of Cape. I've got an idea how the city of Cape works. Now that uh, is where it comes down from Brewster Street to Oakley Street, which should not even be there. If you come right down to it, there was one house back on Oakley 
that the street went to years ago, and one of her, it, I don't even know how to have, well, yeah, I do too. Uh, one of the guys, the boyfriends, are drove straight through, and so the city camp has been putting gravel on that and call it one of their streets. There's a street signed up now, so it is a street, I guess. <laughs> the Renfro property is on the north side of the street. Uh, say, uh, the where land where owns a property on the south side. All of the street has been taken from Lynn's property. And it, I'll bet you, I think ain't 10, 12 foot low. I'm not mistaken, half goes from one side, half goes from Mr. Byer, you all know all about this, because I've been complaining about this for at least 10 years. Now the water that comes off the street comes down to my neighbor's house. There's a picture in there of a sinkhole that's got under our carport. Well, it comes around down to five property, which used to come across the floor of my shed. It's not a working shed, but it's where I piddle at. I'm retired, so I piddle now. The end, <clears throat> a lot of it turned and went under my house. And for some reason, come out on Bruiser Street, not very much so, but down by floor, separating from the wall. My insurance company will not take, come and take responsibility of it. And I haven't been able to get City Cape take responsibility either. Now, there's a picture of that in there. Maybe you got a in there, Mr. Guard. And uh, for that, boy, anyway, now you all have pictures on the back of it. They tell us what everyone is. I have MS now, and that, well, I'm just one of the citizens, Cape, that actually did the physical work before I retired. Now, uh, to get my completely around the block, well, uh, not completely real block, but around my neighbor's house, get to my clotheslines. Do y'all remember what clotheslines was before Grier's? Well, I've gone complete because of the mud there. And every time it rains, it comes through the lens, carport and comes running on down. I've dug a ditch now that goes around my shed so it don't go through my shed like it used to. If y'all like to come out there, I'll be happy to show you what is my hell. You can excuse me, please. <laughs> uh, you could see what it's doing just by looking at it. Now, I've got to run around for a long time. There's still uh, storm drains in the area. Those pictures show you storm drain. I did. I'd be happy to show it to you too. If you just come out and look at it and stop giving me the run around. Mr. Fox, you might not have heard about this yet. That's going to open a whole can of worms. I've not heard about it. Well, but I appreciate uh, you being here, yeah. bringing it to our attention, and we will look into it. Yeah, well, now I've heard that a You've bunch of times. You've heard that before. I know you have. Now, the Renfro property, he fixed his kids good by the property. Did something illegal, or you'll look into it. You'll see what it is. But yeah. You got to go half on his property and half on Lane's if it is a street. It's not even supposed to be there. Matter of fact, Lance still pays taxes on that. So this, now I understand the fire department needs a, a clear route to come around. But the lady on the west side of it, in the, the street it's over there one down there, she put up a, a front yard light at the edge of our property. It's been knocked down numerous times now because that trash truck comes through there and goes completely around. Big truck, I, I can't say that I would drive or I would miss the thing either. You all come out and look at it. You, you appreciate it. And just come right out and tell you, Vietnam was not a war, it was a police action.
If you come around down to it, it was a big ego trip was all it was. Thank you for listening to me. Let me do a little research on exactly where this is. And, well, and, it's uh, on the north side, but the show okay. center. But you all know it. You find it real easy. Okay. We appreciate it. Sorry, guy. Uh, so, so. Well, uh, you can do what you put them in fall 13 if you want to. I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, not really. It shows you exactly what's going on. I, I tell you what I'd really like. If, is if you can talk with Mr. Stan back there, did you, did you know, have you met with Stan? Stan Polovic? Uh, uh, well, I'd yeah. like him to come out and, and look at it because he's Thanks, our stormwater sir. expert. And he can, he can let us know uh, what, what's going on. So I'd like you to, yeah. you said we wouldn't come out. Well, Stan will work with you right now and work out a time when he can take a look at it. Please forgive me for being so, uh, uh, thank you, but I've heard it all before. Okay. I know that. And from you, I have heard it before. I, heard, I was going to come out. I thank you very out. much. Y'all have right. a good evening now. All right. Thank you, sir. Anybody else to speak to before the council for any item that's not on our agenda this evening? If not, we will move right into the agenda review. Thank you, Council. We have um, uh, <clears throat> two public hearings tonight uh, for rezoning the property uh, along 414 uh, th through 426 South uh, Silver Springs Road. This is for uh, the Lutheran home, uh, some, some additional um, uh, big duplexes out there and um, or maybe they're standalone homes um, so it's rezoning of that and then um, the second public hearing is to for the proposed amendment for chapter 30 if you remember uh, last week uh, mr. Skinner was here and talked about the accessory st structures and uh, making that more clear um, we had a certain standard up to a half acre and then a different acre, uh, different sizes up to an acre and this just makes it all, I think, a thousand square feet, uh, anything less than an acre. So it makes it a little clearer and easier uh, for people to understand. And uh, that was recommended by the planning and zoning uh, unanimously. Um, the consent agenda, we have uh, the quick claim deed from the uh, county for the common police courthouse property. Um, the second, third reading of that from last time. And then we have uh, several resolutions. First one is for uh, Crawford, Murphy, and Tilly for design services for the fence project at the airport. Um, number six is the, the these each year uh, working with the university. They take a piece of, of our city and do a historic uh, resource survey and work on that with a, uh, a graduate class. And so that's um, this year's uh, project. Number seven is the capital improvements program. We've had uh, uh, public hearing, we've had discussions, and uh, and so tonight we're asking you uh, for approval of that. Uh, this year's 20 through 25 uh, capital improvement program. Uh, and number eight is finalizing the wastewater treatment uh, facility for with KCI. It's been so long. Um, we. <laughs> We had, if you remember, a dust problem out at the drying facility, and it took us a while to get through that, uh, to uh, to investigate it, to design it, and then to uh, do it, and then get it certified. Uh, so it was a, uh, a long process, took a long time, but now we're through that, and this is a, a milestone to, to be at. Um, number nine, the last consent item is uh, for final payment for our street light. LED street light conversion program for this year. Are there any items you'd like to remove from the consent agenda? If not, we have three uh, new ordinances tonight. The first one is from the first item on the public hearing for the rezoning uh, of um, on South Sil uh, Silver Springs Road. Uh, number 11 is for those accessory structures. Uh, it's changing chapter 30 to do that. And then uh, the number 12 is the ordinance declaring an emergency. Uh, appropriating monies for operating capital expenses uh, 
in, in response to the January uh, cyber attack. Um, we've talked about, about that this a little bit, uh, but uh, we're at the point now where we uh, feel we're not 100% back, but we're back and, and working through it. Uh, we've been able to get almost all of our, all our IT uh, things back in place. And as we do that, we want to look at uh, what it costs to um, for some deductible for our, our policy. Um, we, we did have a, um, uh, a cyber uh, policy that covered our expenses, but there is a deductible associated with that. So that might be one cost that we would use out of this, this appropriate or this um, ability to use emergency funds. And then we also are looking at the entire system and seeing are there things that we need to do that would make us more uh, hardened against future cyber attacks? And do those make sense to do them right now? And could we do them within our budget? Also, obviously, with um, emergency funds, those are funds we have to pay back. We have to pay back a tenth of them each year for 10 years. So it, it is good that we have them available to do things, but we would evaluate that with everything else to see if that's a... A, a an obligation that we want to have for 10 years. So is it worth that? So we haven't gotten through that, but we wanted to go ahead and and uh, have the emergency declared uh, while it's still uh, known in our mind and explain the situation and uh, ask for up to a half a million dollars that we would spend out of it, we would bring back to you for those actual expenditures. So um, that uh, under our charter, any de declaration of emergency and use of the funds uh, in, in this is required a 100% of all members. So it would take 100. It would take all seven votes in order to approve uh, this proposal. Any questions about that? No. I think so. no. Number 13 is the appointment of the board of adjustments. I think. Um, Mayor, you have a. I have that. And um, then we have a closed session item tonight. So I think that's all I have. All right. Thank you, sir. At this point, we'll move into our regular session and have the roll call. Ryan Essex. Here. Bob Fox. Here. Robbie Gard. Here. Stacy Kier. Here. Shelly Moore. Here. Dan Preston, Nate Thomas. Here. I'll understand motion to adopt the agenda. Motion by Dan, seconded by Stacy. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. We have two public hearings this evening. The first public hearing is to consider request to rezone property at 414, 420, 424. 426 South Silver Springs Road from R1 Single Family Suburban Residential District to RUMD, a Residential Urban Mixed Density District. Anybody here this evening to address the council on this public hearing? If not, I will close the public hearing. We have a second public hearing to consider a proposed amendment to chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri regarding accessory structures and uses. Anybody here this evening to speak on behalf of or against this amendment to Code of Ordinances? I don't see anybody getting up, so I will close that public hearing. Anybody here this evening who would like to speak to the council about any item on the agenda this evening? I want everybody to get up at once. All right, if that's the case, we will move right into the consent agenda. Eric? <laughs> Number 20-25, an ordinance accepting a quick claim deed from Cape Girardeau County for the Common Police Courthouse property located at 44 North Ormer Street in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. An ordinance accepting a quick claim deed from Cape Girardeau County for the Common Police Courthouse property located at 44 North Ormer Street in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. 
number 20-27, a resolution authorizing city manager to execute an agreement with Crawford Murphy and Tilly Inc. for design services for the wildlife perimeter fence project at the Cape Girardeau Regional Airport. Number 20-30, a resolution authorizing city manager to execute an agreement with Southeast Missouri State University to prepare an historic resource survey in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Number 20-31, a resolution adopting the 2020 to 2025 capital improvements program in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. You have before you the consent agenda. The motion to accept. Any discussion? Before we vote, Charlie Herbst, do you have a copy of the deed? Do I have a copy? <laughs> 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 yes, we should. I'm just raising you. Thanks for your help on that. We appreciate it. Uh, if no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Consent agenda passes. New ordinances this evening. Bill number 20-28. An ordinance amending the chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri by changing the zoning of property located at 424 and 426 South Silver Springs Road in the city and county of Cape Girardeau, Missouri from R1 to RUMD. So moved. Motion by Robbie, second by Nate. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 20-29, an ordinance amending Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri regarding accessory structures and uses. Motion by Ryan, second by Stacy. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 20-32, an ordinance declaring an emergency and appropriating monies for operating and capital expenditures in response to the January 2020 cyber attack from the Emergency Reserve Fund for the fiscal year 30th in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. An ordinance declaring an, an emergency and appropriating money for operating and capital expenditures in response to the January 2020 cyber attack from the Emergency Reserve Fund for the fiscal year ending June 30th 2020 in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. An ordinance declaring an emergency appropriation monies for operating and capital expenditures in response to the January 2020 cyber attack from the Emergency Reserve Fund for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020 in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Motion by Dan, do I hear a second? Second by Nate. Any discussion? Mayor, I would just point out that one, it's up to 500,000 and that just for clarification, you will bring back each expenditure for us to, to sign off on. Yes. Okay. okay. Good. You hate, you, you hate to dip into emergency funds, but uh, when a situation like this arises, it's, we really got no option and that's what they're for and it will be repaid. So that's the important thing about this. So I we've... trust staff will try to not spend yes. very much. <laughs> now we may not spend any at all. And, you know, it, it, and that's my a point. good business to say. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, <laughs> it makes it part of our looking at see if it is a good spend, expenditure, doesn't mean it is. And it's this is the new age we live in. Uh, the classical way that we think of emergency funds, I mean, you think of our physical structures, if one of them was demolished, mm -hmm. we would use, we would act on our emergency funds. This is our you know essentially a same it's an infrastructure but it was demolished and it was a significant attack yeah. and so i think it you know if we need it to harden ourselves up like you said or to make ourselves less susceptible to it i think it is an appropriate use of those funds since it does require you require you anonymous you want or unanimous do you want to have a roll call vote you go ahead aye aye Aye. 
Thank, Thank you. you all. Uh, I trust our staff will uh, be very diligent in looking at this whole thing and, and do what's best. And that's the important thing. Uh, we do have one appointment tonight. It's important to the Board of Adjustment. And you all have chosen uh, the incumbent, Skip Smallwood. Any other business coming before the council tonight? Yeah, motion. I'll make a motion. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, we need a motion. We have a motion to appoint Skip Smallwood in a second. second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Any other business? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn to closed session for legal actions and litigation, confidential communications of legal counsel, and personnel matters pursuant to precise section Missouri 610-0211 and 3. We are adjourned. Appreciate it. Riley's a good one. Okay. Hey, Ryan. I'll be out there too. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. All right. Have you hear uh, uh, Ann's mom? Yeah. Well, you know, I think, I think Ann was ready. I, you know, she said, uh,